Welcome to ECE302. This is lecture 4.1 on probability density functions. I'm Professor Stanley Chan. So today we are going to talk about continuous random variables. The difference between continuous random variables and discrete random variables is best summarized in the figure here. On the left hand side, we are showing a probability mass function. It is a uh, function that describes the probability for each of the finite states that the random variable has. So for example here, the random variable x has uh, three states, x1, x2, and x3, and the bars here, they represent the probability of each uh, state being happen. So if you go into a continuous random variable, what we are expecting to see is that instead of having all these uh, discrete states, we will have a continuous state. And also we will not have all these masses, but then we will have a continuous function like uh, the one that I'm showing here. Uh, so the difference between the probability mass function and also the probability density function, this is what we call the density function, is that the density function will be a continuous function, and so you cannot count anymore. Uh, instead, you need to do integrations. So the um, in terms of computation, the biggest difference is that you are going uh, from a submission to an integration. Now this is conceptually quite straightforward, but then there are also some issues associated with the continuous uh, random variables. Okay, uh, in particular, how do we really measure uh, and continuous events uh, when we cannot count them? Okay, so yeah, I think you, you can obviously agree with me that uh, we, if we want to calculate some um, uh, continuous events then we need to integrate this probability density function in order to get some probability. Okay, so how do we formalize this concept? That is the goal of this uh, lecture. Here is the outline of today's lecture. We are going to understand the meaning of probability density functions, a new term to many of you. Uh, there are three sections for today's lecture. First of all, we will talk about the intuition about this um, probability density function. And then we are going to uh, give a formal mathematical definition. And then we will talk about the properties. Um, and afterwards, we are going to link a, a probability density function with the probability mass function with the goal of showing that the PMFs can actually be represented as the PDFs. Okay, so let's first talk about the intuition of the probability density functions. The question that we are interested in asking is, how would you ever define this probability, uh, the probability of a set where uh, this x is contained in a, uh, an event A. Now this event A, here we assume that it is a continuous event. Okay, now of course we know how to do this and calculation for discrete events. Uh, if, if imagine that you have a dice, you throw the dice, and then you have six faces. And so if A is a uh, event that contains uh, all the uh, even numbers, then you know, okay, you know how to calculate the probability because you know even events uh, equals to uh, two, four, and six. And so the probability that x is being an even event, you just count three of them out of six, you get one over uh, three over six. But if a is a continuous event, then the calculation becomes a little bit different, okay? Because you cannot count. Um, so, how do we uh, address this problem? Imagine that uh, you have uh, this dice, right? So you have two, uh, four, and uh, you have uh, six. How do you uh, evaluate the set? You, you count them, but you can also think that uh, you you are counting. You you measuring the size of uh, and these events. Okay, 
So let's say a uh, a equals to an even number. Okay, uh, and then how do you measure the size of a? Well, size of a is is three. And then what is the size of your sample space? Well, that's just one to six. You have six, and therefore you get uh, three over six. This is how we calculate for discrete events. Now, how do we do this calculation for continuous event? Let's say here we have a uh, continuous event A, and then there's a sample space uh, omega. Um, both are continuous uh, sets. Now, how do we do that? Well, we can actually measure the area of uh, this set A divided by the area of this uh, sample space omega. So both are measured in terms of uh, area. That will give you a measure of the size uh, of this event A with respect to the sample space omega. You can also do the same calculation if the sample space is a interval on the real line. Uh, let's say here you have an interval A. Uh, for example, this interval is from 0 to 1, and then the omega is an interval maybe from minus 10 to 10. Then you know how to calculate this uh, 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 size of A uh, because the size of A uh, will just be uh, uh, the length uh, of your uh, of your set A divided by the length of your sample space omega. So here we're using length uh, to measure the size of a set. So you can see that this definition of probability if we use the notion of measure, it's actually quite easy to generalize from the counting, where we are counting the number of uh, faces in a dice experiment, uh, to uh, counting the, the area or counting the length of a set. So with this idea in mind, uh, we can then define the measure for continuous events. Now, of course, uh, there are some um, technical issues we need to deal with, but before that, let me talk about an example. Let's say you have an interval of uh, um, uh, uh, from 0 to 5, and then the event is uh, 2 to 3. So here is your uh, omega. This is uh, uh, omega from uh, 0 to 5 with closed interval, so 0 to 5. And then you have um, a, an event A, uh, which is from 2 to 3, and so we want to measure the size of the set. Well, um, uh, you look at this equation here, uh, the size of A, I can calculate the length of A, and in this case, since it is an interval, I can just say I am going to integrate uh, my x over uh, the, 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 side, the, the set A, which is uh, integrating from 2 to 3. Uh, that will give me the number 1. Okay, and you see that this integration is really the way to execute this measure uh, operation. Now, in the denominator, we have uh, this uh, integration over the entire uh, sample space. That will give me 5, and, and therefore, the overall probability is uh, 1 over 5. Now, more formally, if you go down to this uh, this um, part of the slide, you can see that I'm defining the probability in terms of the uh, ratio of the integrals. Now, the denominator, it is just a constant. It is the size of the sample space. And I denote it as uh, the um, uh, omega, and I put the absolute value to denote the size. You can put this uh, omega into this uh, upper uh, uh, integration, the integration in the numerator. And you can see that the integration is essentially just uh, integrating over all the possible uh, elements inside your set A uh, with a weighting function. Uh, this weighting function says that all x has equal probability being happen. And so uh, um, this is um, a function that I put into this integration. And this stands for equally important over an entire sample space omega. Then I integrate over all the possible x. That will give me the probability. So this uh, definition here uh, gives us a way to define the probability for continuous events, which is that if uh, this is a this implies equally probable, then why don't we just replace that with some arbitrary definitions of um, 
of the um, of the weight for each element x. In that case, I will be able to calculate the probability over the set A. So here's the idea. Uh, what if we relax the equal probable assumption? Uh, that means we replace 1 over omega by uh, a function called fx. Okay? So this fx uh, of x, this is what we call the probability density function. Okay? Uh, this x stands for the random variable, and this small x stands for the state. So uh, how do we understand this equation? Uh, the probability that x is being uh, in A is equal to this integration of fx uh, times dx. Uh, let's say here you have your uh, sample space omega, okay, which is a um, big interval. And then uh, on top of this interval, uh, you want to calculate the probability of a set A. Now, uh, without doing anything, you know, okay, I can calculate the length of the set A uh, over the length of the set omega. But now I tell you that on top of this, you want to um, put some weighting function that uh, if your A covers this region, you want to multiply with, uh, you will have a heavier weight than if you are looking at this region. Okay, uh, so uh, this is giving you a some. Uh, somewhat different um, and definition of the probability mass. Okay, in the in the old case, okay, in the discrete case where you have this probability mass, we know that uh, if this is the uh, sample space omega, and then uh, I will have uh, a set uh, A which is uh, inside here, then I just need to count uh, the mass that are living in. Uh, this set A. Okay, for example, this is throwing a dice. You're asking, uh, let's say A is the set uh, that contains numbers between 2 and 3, and so you, you really count the probability of getting a 2 and probability of getting a 3. Uh, so when you go to the continuous uh, case, you, instead of uh, summing these two numbers, you're integrating all the numbers within this interval. And this, this green function here is exactly this uh, fx, which in the in the discrete case is the px. So let's look at this diagram again. I hope now uh, this diagram will make sense to you. What is the difference between a discrete random variable and a continuous random variable? The biggest difference is that we are changing the probability mass to the probability density. Okay, it is called the density function because you you need to integrate the probability uh, density function in order to get a probability unlike the probability mass function where you just count the mass uh, and then you will be able to get the probability so with that notion in mind i think we can now go into a more in-depth discussion about the mathematical definitions of probability mass function uh, density functions and we can also discuss its properties the mathematical definition of a probability density function fx of a random variable x uh, is a mapping uh, called fx that is mapping from the sample space omega to a number uh, r uh, with the property uh, that number one this fx has to be positive for all of x in omega Okay, uh, this is just a very, very basic requirement that all the probabilities has to be positive. The second requirement is that uh, the unity assumption, where if you integrate the uh, probability density function over the entire sample space, you will get one. The third one is the measure. It says that if you want to measure this event A, then all you need to do is to integrate this fx within uh, the set A. Okay, like what we have just shown before. Let's say here is your omega, and then here is your a, and then there is a function fx. Uh, you integrate uh, this function, then you will be able to to uh, to find the probability of a. The definition above is a little bit complicated, and I want to simplify it a little bit uh, because. Uh, for most of the problems that we are encountering, 
we are dealing with uh, random variables on the real line and therefore we do not need to uh, use a very complicated set notation uh, all we need to know is uh, what if I want to calculate the random variable x being inside this interval a and b then it would be the integration of this fx from a to b okay so again it will be this uh, equation that you have omega here and then you have a and then you have b and there's a function then this integration is exactly this uh, area under the curve so let's work out a couple uh, examples here's the first example where we have fx equals to 3x squared and then omega is the set uh, from 0 to 1 so let us draw uh, this function so uh, this fx um, of x uh, is 3x squared, so it's a quadratic equation, so it's going up. And then what? Uh, but now we also need to specify the uh, omega. Omega is the uh, uh, set from 0 to 1. This is your omega, okay? So of course you have stuff outside this omega, but then uh, since they're not inside the sample space, uh, we can ignore them. Uh, inside this uh, omega, there is an event A. Okay, A is uh, from 0 to 0 0.5. This is your event A. Okay, and so now we want to calculate what is the probability. Uh, we want to find the probability of A. Okay, so eventually we are uh, trying to calculate uh, this region. Now, we're not just trying to calculate uh, this region uh, in particular, okay? Uh, we are actually trying to calculate uh, uh, the area under the curve. Okay, so here, uh, this is uh, the uh, region from 0 to 0 0.5, and so we are calculating area under the curve, which is uh, this segment. So how do we do that? Well, uh, as I'm showing you in this uh, equation here, uh, you are integrating uh, from 0 to 0 0.5 of um, this function uh, 3x squared okay and then uh, now you can you can integrate and we know how to do this integration okay so that's just a simple integration and you can calculate the number and you can find that this is uh, 1 over a how about the other example here the other example says that I have uh, fx equals to a constant okay so let's say this is this is your fx of x and then this is x and then uh, this fx is uh, is defined on an omega which is from 0 to uh, to 5 this is my omega and then uh, my function uh, fx is a constant okay so this is 1 over uh, omega so this is a constant and now I want to find uh, the event a which is from uh, 3 to 5 Okay, so it's from 3 to 5, and now I want to find the area under the curve from 3 to 5. Okay, so how do we do this? Uh, so you integrate uh, from 3 to 5 of uh, this function, this is fx, and then you can plug in the number. Uh, what is uh, omega? Uh, this is just 5 because uh, the length of omega is 5. Uh, so you put this number in, and you calculate, then you can get this probability. The probability that x equals uh, is between 3 and 5 is 2 over 5. So I hope by now you can see that the calculation of the probability you, uh, for continuous events uh, are actually not too complicated. It's just that we replace all the submissions by integrations. As long as we know what, uh, what is this probability density function, uh, fx, uh, we can just plug that in into our integration. Now here comes the question, um, can this probability density function fx be bigger than 1? Okay, Because if we recall the definition above, we only require fx, to be, uh, fx of x to be bigger than or equal to 0. We never require that uh, fx uh, of x to be uh, less than or equal to 1. We, we do not require that. Okay, uh, so we can ask, can, can fx be bigger than 1? Uh, surprisingly, the answer is yes. Why? 
because fx is not the probability of having x at x. Okay, it is the probability per unit length. So what do I mean that? Consider that uh, we are calculating this uh, probability where x is between a small x and a small x plus some uh, very very small delta. Then according to our definition, we need to integrate this function fx from x uh, to x plus delta. Now this calculation is approximately equal to fx at x times the delta. So if you go to this diagram here, you can see that fx is the height. Okay, so this is fx. And the delta is the width. When you multiply them together, that will give you the area of this uh, vertical bar. Okay, so now, now if your delta is actually very, very small, there is no requirement for x to be bounded by 1 because on the left hand side, this is the probability. This has to be between uh, 0 and 1. Okay, so this is the probability has to be between 0 and 1. But now, since you have a delta here, um, uh, this fx does not need to be uh, 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 less than 1 because the delta can be smaller than 1. Okay, and so uh, essentially what you need to know is that fx is really not the probability of having x at x. It's just that the fx is the probability per unit length and you need to specify the length in order to define the probability. The axiom requires that the probability is between 0 and 1. It does not require that the probability density function to be between 0 and 1. Okay. Um, so if you try to use map or Python to compute the probability density function, you can show that uh, there are many, many cases. Let's say you plug in Gaussian function. Uh, you can get this um, probability density function to be bigger than 1. It is, it is very, very common. And that's correct because fx is not uh, the uh, uh, probability happening at x. Now, this is different from a discrete random variable. The discrete random variable, you have all these uh, uh, probability masses. What would be the, the width? Okay, the width, this delta for the, for the discrete random variable, this is actually 1. Okay, and therefore, uh, when you have this 1 here, uh, then this fx, uh, it becomes uh, this px, px of x, okay? And so you have this delta, which is 1, then px, of course, it cannot be bigger than 1. Otherwise, the probability would be bigger than, than 1, okay? So you need to understand that for discrete random variables, this px has to be bounded by 1, okay? For fx, uh, this is not required. Let us work out one more example to illustrate this idea. So um, suppose you have a random variable x with pdf fx equals to uh, this, uh, 1 over 2 times root uh, x. So this function looks like uh, uh, this. It was a decaying function. And then this uh, sample space is from 0 to 1. And then uh, it's 0 otherwise, OK? So we can, uh, okay, I cannot include the zero, so it has to be an open interval. Because if I include the zero, then, uh, then, then this fx will, uh, will become an infinity, so which, which is a little bit undefined here. Okay, uh, so how do we, um, we can show that, okay, we can show that this fx goes to infinity as x goes to zero. Okay, so let me make it uh, a little bit clearer, so it's actually going to uh, plus infinity. Okay. Uh, however, this fx remains a valid PDF for the following reason. Uh, you integrate uh, this PDF from 0 to 1, you integrate this, okay, you integrate from 0 to 1, uh, this is the size of your uh, entire sample space, then you integrate that, uh, you carry out this integration, uh, and that will give you square root of x and you evaluate from 0 to 1, that will give you number 1. Okay. Now, what, the, what is so special about this uh, PDF is that this, this PDF has this fx uh, going to infinity as x goes to 0. Okay. Uh, of course, we do not include this uh, uh, 0 here because we don't want it to, 
to uh, really be at infinity. Okay, because when it is a B and infinity, then there's some problem. Um, okay, so uh, with that, then you can see that uh, this probability function, uh, this fx, is clearly it is bigger than one. Okay, it's clearly bigger than one. However, it is still a legitimate probability density function, uh, for the reason being that uh, you need to integrate this probability density function over the entire space, sample space, and that will still give you uh, one. Now, note that you cannot have probability density function going to negative. If you go to negative, then there will be some problem because, uh, it, it, let's say, uh, you have you have some mass, just a little bit of mass, okay, being negative. Then, if I create an event uh, which is covering this area A, then I will be able to get a probability that is less less than zero. This is not allowed, okay. However. Uh, if you have uh, a number that's going to plus infinity, this is okay because uh, as long as your delta is small enough, the probability will still be uh, less than 1. Okay, so there's a small remark here. Uh, isolated points have zero measure in continuous uh, space, and therefore probability of uh, um, the closed interval of A and B is equal to the probability of open interval of A and B, that's also equal to the semi-open, semi-closed intervals A and B. So we have discussed the uh, intuition. We have also discussed the definition. And now we want to link the probability density function with the probability mass functions. How do we write a probability mass function in terms of probability density function? Uh, here is the idea. We can write uh, the probability uh, mass function uh, as this px evaluated at xk, and then we multiply with uh, these functions. We call them the delta functions. Okay, and then we can define uh, this thing called the PDF. Now, what is it? So let's go from a uh, discrete random variable. So here is a uh, probability mass function. Okay, so you have. Uh, uh, sample space omega, you have uh, state uh, x1, x2, and x3. They have probability mass values of p at x1, uh, p at x2, and then p at x3. Okay, these x2, 1, 2, and 3, they're not necessarily 1, 2, and 3. They can be uh, uh, 5, 10, or 15, uh, any number. Okay, um, so when you have this is when you have this uh, probability mass function, we ask, can we can we write them as uh, uh, a probability density function? Because how do you express that? Well, right now, we just say that uh, it, it is a, a discrete set of numbers. Okay, but now if you want to write it in terms of function, then we can say that this, um, that we can define a function called a delta function. Okay, so this delta function, it is a very interesting function. Uh, it has a uh, impulse uh, at zero, and then zero otherwise. Okay, so this is a delta function. Now, what is a delta function uh, when you um, when you move um, the position of the delta function by x one? Then this delta function uh, will just uh, go to uh, x one. Okay, so it will still be zero everywhere except at x one then you get a delta function. So now we can multiply this uh, uh, delta function x minus x1 with this p of x1. Then what does it mean? Then we can uh, multiply this height, uh, go to um, p of x1. So instead of a, um, a unit length, we multiply this number uh, by p x1. Then we can add them up. Then that means we have uh, x1, x2, and x3. Uh, so then we can have a function uh, which has uh, which has a pulse here at x1, and then another pulse, and then another pulse. Okay, x2 and x3. So this is px1, px2, and px3. Okay. So this is a probability density function of a probability mass function. So here are two examples. The first example is about a Bernoulli random variable where Px uh, 
uh, has uh, two states. So you have one and uh, a zero. Okay. Uh, so if we draw the diagram, you have uh, two states. One is zero. The other one is one. So this is px at uh, zero. This is uh, px at uh, one. Uh, then according to the uh, theory we just described, then we can write fx as what? As as delta x at zero, and then delta x at one, and then you multiply this with uh, p zero and then p one, uh, then you can get to this uh, PDF. This is your fx. Similarly, uh, we can work on this example where your px is a uh, binomial random variable. Then you can write this fx as the summation of all these delta functions, and you can plug in all your your, uh, your, your px, which is this binomial formula, then you can get the PDF expression of your of the PNF. Uh, here's the third example. Uh, if you have a discrete random variable, where it's a, it's a geometric random variable, okay, uh, and then uh, you have this px uh, equals to uh, 1 over 2 uh, k, uh, then we can write this fx um, being uh, this uh, summation from 1 to infinity uh, with all these delta functions. Okay, and then you can plug in this delta, uh, this px, which is 1 over 2 to the power k. But we can also ask what is the probability that x is between uh, 1 and 2. Uh, and this calculation is that um, uh, you can integrate this fx, this is the approach using the PDF, and then you plug in this function here, this is the um, PDF expression of the uh, probability masses, and then you can have uh, this uh, delta function at 1, delta function at 2, and so on. Uh, in addition, you have all these numbers, 1 half, 1 fourth, and so on. Then you do this integration. You have the in this integration from 1 to 2 for this delta function, uh, delta function uh, uh, 1 to 2 uh, for x minus 2, uh, delta function, and so on. Now note that uh, this delta function, if you integrate from 1 to 2 for this, um, uh, uh, let, let's say here you have delta of x minus 1, and then you are integrating from, from 1 uh, to 2, uh, this should be included. Okay? And also, if you have this delta of x minus 2, this should also be included. However, when you go to x minus 3, uh, this is here, delta of x minus 3, this is not included, okay? So uh, there are lots of things that are not included, and so they will give you 0, 0, and so on. For the things that are included, you integrate the delta function, that will give you 1. And then you, when you multiply with this 1 half, 1 fourth, uh, that will just give you exactly the probability masses when you sum them together, 1 half and 1 fourth, that will give you 3 fourths. Okay, so if you don't want to go through this route, obviously no one wants to go through this route. Uh, you know that uh, x is between uh, one or two, and then we know that this is a discrete uh, uh, random variable. Uh, this is one half. This is one fourth. This is one eighth, uh, and so on. This is one two and three. Uh, we just need to count uh, one half plus one fourth, and we know that this is uh, three fourth. Uh, this is this is very easy and straightforward when you look at this discrete random variable. But if you insist of uh, linking this discrete random variable with the continuous random variable by writing the delta functions, you can still do this calculation. And here is the, the argument that you can do this uh, integration with the delta functions. But just pay attention that the delta function is only evaluated at those points where you have masses. And so those will give you one. Other places, you just, you just don't get uh, any value, okay? So that will give you the exact same result. Now, uh, as far as um, the problems are concerned, uh, if it is a discrete problem, of course, you can just go with this approach. Here is an illustration of how do we unify uh, discrete random variables with continuous random variables uh, all through the notion of probability density functions. So to summarize this lecture, I hope you can memorize this diagram uh, from the discrete random variables to continuous random variables. In a discrete case, you have all these uh, impulses. Uh, they are the probability masses. And in the continuous case, you have a curve. And then in order to calculate the probability, you need to integrate this curve. Uh, the intuition says 
is that uh, this probability is also measured by a new measure, which is the integration in a continuous uh, space. Uh, the definition uh, tells us that this probability density function is the probability per unit length, okay? And therefore, pfx at x is not a probability at x. It's just the probability per unit length at x. Uh, and therefore, fx bigger than 1 is allowed for the PDF and is not allowed for the PMF. And now, how do we connect uh, the PMF with the PDF? We can use the delta functions. Okay, so uh, I hope this lecture has uh, introduced some interesting results to you. I hope you have learned the probability density function, and you know how do we measure in a continuous space. Uh, if you have any question, um, please send us an email, uh, post your questions on Piazza. Uh, we also encourage you to try our homework problems. Uh, a lot of these details uh, of this lecture uh, are all written in the ebook. I encourage you to check out our ebook. Thank you very much.